Hey, friends, welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I am Bishop A. Reginald Littman, your host. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you'll be notified every time new content is loaded here on the channel. Well, as you may be aware, we've been in a series over the last three weeks or so where we're learning lessons from the 12 disciples. This week we're in part four, and we're going to be talking about walking with John, lessons from the beloved disciple. You know, beloved disciple was the nickname of this particular John, who is the brother of James of Zebedee, who we talked about last week. So if by chance you missed last week or the weeks before, go back and catch up after you watch this. And again, we're so excited to welcome you. Please like, share, subscribe, and do let others know that we are actually here. So I hope that you have a pen and paper. And don't forget that right down in the description box below, there is, as always, your free PDF handout that accompanies this teaching. What makes it so great is that you not only get notes from that which I'm covering in the study, but you also, also receive some very intriguing and thought-provoking personal discovery questions that will help you take a deep dive into the scripture and to apply the teaching to your everyday life. I always encourage people to share that PDF with others. You can print it. You can forward it via email to others that you love or even like for that matter. Even if you don't like them, this series on the 12 disciples will help you to learn how to like folks and love folks a little bit better. So I want you to share that and you can call somebody on the phone or have a text Bible study as you go over the material together. So I do want you to be sure to access that again. It is free 99 and uh, we want you to access that. So let's jump into this week's teaching, Walking with John, Lessons from the Beloved Disciple. So John, the son of Zebedee, is a remarkable figure in the New Testament. You know, he is often referred to as the beloved disciple. Another way to put that is the apostle of love. His life and ministry with Jesus provides us with valuable insights into faith, leadership, and even redemption. So as we embark on this part of our study, we're going to journey through the life of John, exploring his background, profession, his calling, and some of the key moments that he shared with Jesus. And of course, our goal, as always, is to draw lessons from his examples that we can apply to our own lives, deepening our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and growing as one of his faithful disciples. So again, if you're just jumping on, welcome to part four of our study, Lessons from the Twelve Apostles. And this week, we're talking about walking with John, Lessons from the Beloved Disciple. So John's life and ministry was was with Jesus. It was it was something that will provide us with some very valuable insights into faith, leadership, and redemption. His life while with Jesus was such a teachable moment that you and I can extract a whole lot from. So let's talk about the background of John's life. John was a fisherman working alongside his brother James and their father Zebedee. They were from the town called Bethsaida, and they later lived in a place called Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. And this very humble beginning was indeed something that set the stage for an extraordinary transformation. And you know what? We often find God calling individuals from the most unexpected places, don't we? So as we go through this this week, I want you to think about your own background and your own upbringing. And how can your past experiences and circumstances be a part of God's plan literally for your life? 
Well, what we should understand is that his humble beginnings really do set a stage for God to use him in tremendous ways. And likewise, our beginnings also set the stage for God to use us in tremendous ways. Let's talk about his profession. So John's profession as a fisherman taught him some valuable lessons in patience, perseverance, and certainly in teamwork. All of these would be important aspects of fishing and it still is today, but especially when he would become a fisher of men. You see, fishing required hard work and dedication. And friends, these qualities would serve him well in his future ministry. Let's look at his calling now, because one day Jesus called John to follow him. And we find it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. It reads like this. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. We actually looked at this last week as we were talking about his brother and him sort of being called at the same time and how they were willing to leave the familiar, which included their father, to embrace their heavenly father and their future. Question is, are you and I willing to give up some of the familiar in order to embrace the future? That's challenging, isn't it? Well, that's just one of the many lessons that we learn from this particular disciple's life. So let's talk about some of the key moments in John's ministry. So the first key moment in John's ministry is witnessing the transfiguration. And of course, we talked about this in our last episode, so I won't go back through it. But if you recall, there's the appearance of Christ, of Moses and Elijah. Peter, James, and John are there to witness as Jesus becomes glistening and glowing in all of his glory. And that was an experience that he could experience with James and with Peter as well. The second key moment in John's ministry was he was present at the raising of Jairus' daughter. And that's a beautiful story about Jairus, who was a synagogue ruler who came to Christ in faith out of desperation for Christ to heal his daughter, which dies, of course, as they're on the way, because there's this divine interruption of the woman with the issue of blood who comes behind Jesus and touches the prayer shawl tassels that would be on a Jewish man's garment that would be used during prayer. And as she does that, of course, she gets her miracle and there's a whole conversation. And while Jesus is talking to her and takes her out of obscurity and puts her now in front of everybody because of her faith, they come with messages to Jairus don't even bother with Jesus, your daughter is dead. But John was there to witness with Peter and James the miracle of Jesus waking up Jairus' daughter from the dead. That's a wonderful story that you can find in the book of Mark chapter number five. So let's look at the next key moment in John's ministry. The third key moment in John's ministry was that he was chosen as one of the inner circle with Peter and James. If you recall, that would be the moment that we just talked about where this trilogy, I like to call it, begins. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. This inner circle that Christ allowed to see things that others did not get to witness. I don't know if it was because of their faith or because of what they would contribute later on to the work of Christ after his ascension to heaven. But for whatever reason, these three would always be in the immediate circle, if you will, of Jesus. And the great news is today, you and I can be in the immediate circle 
because that circle is not limited to three. It's limited to those who will believe and trust Christ for the impossible and for the supernatural. Are you in that circle? I am because I trust him for the supernatural. All right. So, so far we have the first key moment is that he witnessed the transfiguration of Christ. The second key moment is that he was present at the raising of Jairus' daughter. So he saw miracles. And the third is that this would sort of lead out to a habitual practice of being close and intimate and having a front row seat to all the miracles that Jesus would do. So here's the fourth key moment in John's ministry. The Last Supper, and this is a beautiful, beautiful passage right here, because we see this particular disciple, John, the beloved disciple, as he is reclining on Jesus's bosom there at the final meal prior to Christ's crucifixion. And we find this amazing, beautiful picture in the Gospel of John, chapter 13 and verse number 23. And it reads like this, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, referring to John here, was reclining next to him. And oh, what a precious, precious moment that must have been to have been that close to Jesus that you felt that you could lay your head on his shoulder, on his chest. And he was close to Jesus at his very moment that he was about to go out and feel humanity's weight rest on him, the weight and the pressure of the impending cross and crucifixion and taking on the sins of the entire world. John was the one that gave him love and affection at a very low moment in his life. And you know what? That in and of itself is a message and a lesson because everybody needs love and affection. If Christ needed it, what would make us think that people who were made by Christ that may or may not even know Christ. It doesn't matter. But what does matter is that all people need love, all people need affection and affirmation. And that's just the bottom line. And we see John as the disciple who gives that to Christ at the moment he needed it the most. Maybe there's somebody you need to pick up the phone or maybe they're in your household that you need to show love and affection to. Well, the fifth key moment in John's ministry was that he stood at the foot of the cross during the crucifixion. Now that's so powerful because a lot of people loved on Jesus for what he did for them, but John was there when Jesus needed him the most. You know, many people love you as long as you're on your feet, but a lot of people change with you when you're at your worst. And yet we see that John is beloved even before Jesus is at his worst, if you will, by being on the cross. He was actually there during the crucifixion. Many of the disciples were terrified. They were living in fear because they uh, knew that they were next. If they got rid of the leader, surely they were coming for the body. But John is right there. And he's standing there with both of the Marys and some of the women that have followed Jesus. And listen to what he says here in John 19, 26, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And if you follow this passage out, he goes on to say to John, behold your mother. We're not sure what happened to uh, John's mother. But at this point in time, Jesus pauses the final breaths while dying to ensure that his mother is secure. Because in the times of the New Testament, uh, really the entirety of the both Testaments, women had no uh, rights to property or those kinds of things. And so there was no inheritance. Um, and so Jesus wanted to ensure that Mary would be cared for. But because John had been so faithful to him and caring for him, even to the very end, 
he wanted John to be cared for. And so he gives Mary a replacement son and he gives John a replacement mother. And it's so interesting how he put somebody in charge of his mother who he knew loved him. By the way, this is for free. You want to put people in charge of those you love, whether it be your children, those who teach your children or work with your kids or grandkids, somebody who loves Jesus. That's important. So this is a great key moment in John's ministry. Well, let's go to number six. Number six, the sixth key moment in John's ministry is that he was commissioned by Jesus to care for his mother. We just saw that, that not only was she given a son, but John was entrusted with the mother of Jesus to take, take her in and to take care of her for the rest of his life because her role in Jesus's life was now complete. He was not going to be her son in the flesh that would continue to stay with her. He was getting ready to go back home to the father. And so he knew she would need someone to care for him. And he commissions and trust and entrust his earthly mother to the care of John. And so this is such a beautiful, beautiful passage of scripture. Here's the seventh key moment in John's ministry is that he witnessed the empty tomb and he believed. So again, some people will love you when you're on your feet, but they'll leave you when you're knocked off your feet. Not so with John. John loved Jesus while things were good and when things got bad. But then there are people who love you when things are good and things are bad, but the moment it looks like it's over, they let go of you. Not so with John. Man, we all need friends like John in our life, don't we? And we all need to be the kind of disciple that John was. Because let's look at John chapter 20, verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, in your moment of meditation and devotion, and don't forget to get the handout that goes with this teaching, because you'll find the scriptures there, and you can reference them in your different translations, in your app or your page turn or what have you. But it says there, and the entire context of this would be John 20, verse 1 through 10. But I just want to share for the sake of brevity, verse 8 and 9. And it says there in the NIV, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. Now, this was actually referring to John. There were two uh, disciples, according to John's um, report of this story, who had gone in to see the tomb. Verse 9. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So John was one, according to the rendering of the gospel of John, that saw the empty tomb. And though he did not understand the scripture being fulfilled, he believed. He believed so much that he went back to the other disciples and began to talk about the good news of the empty tomb. Question is, are we being good disciples? Are we talking about the empty tomb? Are we just talking about Jesus dying on the cross? Because that's not the full story. That's not the magnitude of the power. It is the empty tomb uh, that represents the resurrection from dead places that we can all experience in our lives. That's what we need to share with other people. Amen? So we looked at the seven key moments in John's ministry. And if you just tuned in, make sure you watch to the end and then go back and rewind and get the PDF that goes with the teaching. It's right there in the description box below. So now let's take a look at lessons from John's faith, leadership, and redemption. His faith, his leadership, and his redemption. So Here's lesson number one and a takeaway for you for this week's lesson. Number one, John's unwavering faith in Jesus, even during difficult times, teaches us the importance of steadfastness and trust in Christ. So we should have an unwavering faith. And how do we see it played out? Well, John loved Jesus while he was alive. John loved Jesus while he was dying. 
John loved Jesus enough to even go to the grave after he was resurrected, although he didn't know that he was resurrected. And so his faith remained unwavering even during the most difficult times. Because think about it, he saw his beloved Savior be crucified, be called all sorts of names. He saw him dying on the cross. He saw his mother through the most tumultuous moment in her life as she watched her son that she gave birth to, the Son of God, being crucified. And he takes her in and he takes her on as his mother. That's unwavering faith during the most difficult of times. You know, we can have the greatest faith in the world when things are going great, when there's plenty of food, plenty of finances, plenty of, of uh, physical blessings, but what about during the difficult times? And so this is a lesson from John's faith that we can all take for our own. But secondly, John's leadership style was characterized by humility and servanthood. And you and I can learn to lead by example and to also care for others. His leadership is seen in taking on the mother of Christ. You can live this out by taking on those things that Christ loves the most. That's peace, that's love, that's joy, that's gentleness, that's long suffering, that's meekness, that's temperance, that's faith. All of those are attributes that are represented by Mary, that you and I can embrace, take on, bear those characteristics of humility and servanthood, and we can learn to lead by example as we show care, concern, compassion, and love for other people. Well, here's number three. Lesson number three from John's faith, leadership, and his redemption now John's redemption story shows us that God can transform our lives and use us for his divine purposes, regardless of our past. Now, what do I mean here? Well, there is simply this. John was a fisherman. He was not an educated man. He was not a physician like Luke was. He was not a tax collector that would have financial education and awareness training, uh, taxation like Matthew. Uh, he was just a simple, ordinary, common, everyday blue collar man. Yet his redemption story shows us that God can transform our lives and use us for his divine purposes, regardless of our past. Guess what? The same is true for every human being that is walking on the face of the earth today. If given the opportunity, God can absolutely transform a life and he can use anybody. I don't care where they came from, what they struggled with. He can use anybody for his divine purposes, regardless of their past. That my friends is a message that you and I need to busy ourselves sharing with this world. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God can transform your life. God can use you for his divine purpose, regardless of our past. And I love that message because I live out that message in my everyday life. Look for God in other people. I don't care if they're not acting godly at the moment. Look for God in other people and learn to love people right where they are, because that's what God does with us. Love people where they are, and then God can show you what he can do through the people that you love. Wow. I'm loving this series. How about you? Let me know what you think about this teaching in the comments. I look forward to hearing from you. That keeps me encouraged um, and keeps me motivated to keep doing all of this hard work to pull this together. Hey, I love you so much. Don't forget to tune in right here. Same channel, same YouTube channel, 930 every Sunday morning as we enjoy together the word of God and the worship of God in our live broadcast. And tune in same time next week for another episode of the Midweek Refill. Until next week, this is Bishop Littman saying, you go with God. Don't forget, get the PDF and like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. Let me know what you think about the teaching.
if you're enjoying this series. God bless you. I'll see you next time.